There certainly has been a change in the function of the American government. In the beginning, it was set up with a definite system of checks and balances, and the executive and judicial and, and uh, legislative branch were supposed to be fairly equal, so they could check each other. There's been a change, gradual change over the years, starting primarily with World War I. When there was this great crisis, we had to defend ourselves against uh, foreign enemies. And ever since then, one crisis after another has added to the impetus for us to change our form of government, supposedly to make us more secure. So we've given up that checks and balances concept gradually. It's been reinforced by Supreme Court decisions. It's been reinforced by new legislation. And it's been reinforced by the media and primarily reinforced by the apathy of the American people if not their total ignorance of the way it should be because they don't teach this in school anymore. So it's happened. No matter how it's happened or who's responsible, it has happened. So that now we do not have checks and balances between three forms or three branches of government. A realistic appraisal is that we have a dictatorship. It's a democratic dictatorship. And most of the power resides in the hands of the President of the United States. Originally, the president was supposed to be like the president of any corporation. He took orders from the board of directors. And he didn't determine policy, major policy at least, maybe, maybe minor policy, but the major decisions were made by the board of directors. And his job was merely to implement those policies. That's the way it used to be in America. The president was relatively um, unimportant person. He was selected by the by the states, and he was to uh, implement policies of the Congress. Today, that's not the case. Today, the president is basically the same as a king. We don't call him a king. We don't say, Your Highness. We say, Mr. President. But he has almost unlimited powers, the same as any great ruler of history. And Congress, although we still think of it as being uh, an important body, pretty much steps back and lets the president do whatever he wants to do. Uh, Congress theoretically has the power of the purse because they can vote the money to um, fund the uh, projects of the president. But even that has been circumvented because now the president has worked, and the, not just the current president, but this whole process has worked out ways and means by which, in partnership with the Federal Reserve System, they can create funding without Congress. So now the president has special funds for this and special funds for that and secret funds for this. The president can, with a stroke of a pen, just uh, create all kinds of money without Congress even having any say-so in it at all. So we come to the sad conclusion that the United States is no longer the country it was. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Uh, the old methods of writing a letter to your congressman don't work anymore. It's time for a fundamental change. And that's not going to happen, though, until more and more Americans, first of all, wake up to the reality of their present plight. They were still living in a dream world, still reading in our history books, you know, looking at pictures of George Washington and his white socks and so forth, and the signing of the Declaration, and we think it's still that way. It's not that way, folks. And so people live in this dream world. The first step is to realize what we're really living under, what kind of a system we're really living under, and then to go back and figure out what kind of a system do we want to restore. And I think restoring the concepts in our original Constitution is a great step forward, not backward, but forward. We've been going backwards toward monarchy ever since World War I. We have to go forward now to the past, if I can coin that phrase. And, uh, but that's not going to happen until a large number of, of Americans understand that it has to happen. So that's, what is that, an optimistic or a pessimistic view? I think it's an optimistic view in the long run. It's a pessimistic view in the short run because nothing like that is going to happen by November. It's not going to happen in the next election. 
Americans are always focused on, well, how can we make this happen quickly so I can go back to my golf game? You know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. If I, I'll become active maybe for a few months and I'll, I'll vote for a candidate or something, but don't drag this thing out, please, because I'm too busy. They want to know how we can turn this all around by the next election. It can't be done by the next election, but it can be done. That's the optimistic part. I think if we have a realistic view of the political process, and we know that uh, it takes sometimes a generation or two for really important changes to happen. And if we understand that and accept it, and accept our role in being responsible for making it happen, then you can go to sleep at night and say, by golly, I'm really doing something about this, and I am making a difference, and it will happen. I don't know when the administrative branches of uh, government became totally dominant. All I know is that it was a little bit at a time and it uh, sort of like um, a jerky motion. Every time there's a crisis, every time there's a war, every time there's a terrorist attack, or every, if there's a banking crisis, no matter what the crisis is, this movement toward totalitarianism accelerates. And then it slows down until the next crisis comes along. And uh, I don't know if I could say at what point that happened, but I, I can say that it did happen, and it's even... Cons uh, continuing today.